right, so since we're right at noon UK time, I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. Um, so welcome to the core materials, better concrete, better steel. Uh, this session dives into the two highest impact materials in the building sector, concrete and steel, and explains why they're carbon intensive and how to reduce the embodied carbon of concrete and steel today through the design and specification. The learning objectives are displayed here. If you're looking to get AIA continuing education credit, uh, we'll be following up with a survey after this event with more information on how to submit your AIA member number. Um, and any questions we're not able to get to into the, in the Q&A, we'll um, ask our speakers to, to answer and then we'll post that later on the Carbon Positive website. Um, so with that, I am thrilled to introduce our two speakers today, uh, Catherine DeWolf and Matthew Winvin smith uh, our first speaker will be Catherine. Uh, Catherine is a postdoctoral scientist at TU Delft, where she conducts, conducts research on digital innovation for a circular economy in design and construction management. Catherine obtained her civil engineering and architecture degree and has previously practiced with ERA. Uh, Catherine will be followed by Matthew, uh, who is the policy and standards director at Responsible Steel, an initiative he'll be sharing more about in his presentation. Uh, Matthew has worked on a range of projects in the forestry sector, setting up the accreditation program for the Ford Stewardship Council and in the mining, minerals, and metal sector, including work for the Alliance for Responsible Mining and more. Um, with that, Catherine, go ahead and uh, share your screen. Great, thank you. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for inviting me to talk about the work that we did on uh, the concrete industry. So before I start, I just want to mention that I did this work with uh, Aurélie Favier, Guillaume Haber and Karen Scrivener, uh, who are at ETH and at EPFL, the Swiss Federal Institutes of Technology. And you can find this work in the report that we did for the Europe Climate Foundation, which I show here on the slide. Um, so really what got me into this, uh, in, into this topic is, is looking at those building structures. And here you see two, two domes that uh, at the time of their construction were the largest concrete domes in the world. So you might recognize the, the Pantheon of Rome uh, built about 2000 years ago and then the Kingdom in Seattle uh, built in the 70s. And this is what happened only 24 years after its construction. Um, so it got imploded uh, and so this really sparks the question um, what do we do about those concrete structures um, if their lifetime is, is shorter and shorter uh, and how uh, do we deal with the embodied carbon of those building structures. Now there are different, different challenges that we try to address in our research. Uh, the first is the energy and greenhouse gas emissions and when you look at the cement industry uh, it's about 5% of all uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So I think there is a, a major role to play for the cement and concrete industry here. Um, the second challenge is waste. Really a lot of um, construction and demolition waste is created. And in Europe, it accounts for about 30% of all solid waste generated in Europe. Um, Uh, the third challenge is resource depletion. And um, in fact, we might think that we have a huge amount of sands available in deserts, but desert sand is usually too fine for concrete. And so we mine about 40 billion tons of sand and gravel every year. Um, and here you see a graph that shows you uh, the population growth and then the cement consumption here. Um, so you see that we use an increasing amount of cement uh, for a person and we also have the population growth. So um, there is really a, a lot of work to do uh, to keep the environmental impact of the cement production and, and concrete production to a minimum. Uh, so what we did in the report is really looking at the complete value chain and see what we could change and which direction we could take to decarbonize the concrete sector. So we did a lot of interviews with European associations, constructors, and cement producers. Um, and so there are four strategies laid out in the report. Uh, the first one is really try to decarbonize clinker production as much as possible. Um, and so clinker is a solid material produced in the manufacture of, of Portland cement as an intermediary, uh, intermediary product. Um, and um, a second strategy is really using less clinker in cement. Uh, 
another strategy is using less cement in concrete and the last strategy is using less concrete in buildings so basically each time we try to kind of reduce the, the carbon intensive uh, intensive uh, ingredient of the materials so let's start with the first strategy less carbon in clinker production um, so basically clinker has about 875 kilograms of co2 equivalents per ton of clinker uh, that we emit and 30 30 to 40 percent of this uh, comes from the energy required to heat the limestone and clay at the right temperature. 60 to 70 percent is from the chemical reaction uh, of the decarbonization of limestone. Um, so here are different uh, technologies uh, that we can use to, to reduce this uh, carbon content of clinker. Uh, obviously we can use dry technologies which are much more efficient uh, in terms of carbon emissions. Uh, we can use alternative fuels uh, to drive down this, uh, this, this uh, emissions of the energy required. We can do also carbon capture and storage, or we can use alternative binders. I would invite you to read the report to see a bit the details of those different uh, techniques that we discussed. Um, so less clinker in cement uh, is also an option to reduce the carbon impact of concrete. Uh, buildings and so basically the average clinker to cement ratio in Europe is 0 0.73 uh, but we can also use supplementary cementitious materials uh, to substitute some of the clinker uh, and we can also try to improve the early strength development of these blended cements uh, through efficient grinding so we can also use alternative raw materials uh, including recycling fines and so on and so an example that I want to show you of recycling concrete is, um, is really the, the work that uh, the International Olympic Committee did on uh, building their new headquarters. So you see on the left, you see the old uh, headquarters in Lausanne and on the right, you see the new headquarters and 98% uh, of the concrete was uh, recycled here. Um, so we can also use less cement in concrete and we've shown in our report that there is an overconsumption of 20% uh, of the cement compared to what the standards requires. Um, and usually concrete producers want to reduce risk, so they add a, a big error mar margin. But also uh, when we talk about exposure classes in the standards, usually we take the most conservative exposure class for the entire building or an entire part of the building, even though the different elements uh, would uh, need other exposure classes that has lower uh, cement contents. Uh, so basically using a more appropriate exposure class would, would uh, reduce the cement content. Another um, strategy would be to improve the granular packing or use uh, admixtures to use less cement in concrete. And then finally, our fourth strategy is really using less concrete in buildings. And uh, this can be done in two different ways. First, uh, we can start optimizing. And so this is, for example, uh, a uh, funicular force lab designed by the Block Research Group, where they were inspired by a Quastafino tile vaulting system uh, so that they could make this floor slab that uses about 75% uh, less of the weight in concrete compared to a normal slab, uh, a conventional slab. We can also just reuse concrete. Uh, and this is, for example, uh, the circular retrofit lab uh, at the VUB, which is my uh, home university where I got my degree. Um, and so they have these, these uh, elements on campus uh, from the 70s, which, we, which they are reconverting now, uh, thanks to their um, ease of reuse thanks to these pre prefabrication units. So this obviously works more easily with uh, prefabricated concrete than with uh, concrete cast in situ. Um, and so here is another example of work done by EPFL uh, students uh, in Saint Aubin in Switzerland, where they redesigned uh, different types of structures with these prefab elements here from this concrete structure and here you see that they were trying to see how they could disassemble this building structure. So we looked at different scenarios in this uh, in this report. Uh, so first the first scenario the first scenario is really the, the reference scenario. So this is really just asking a low investment for from one actor, the cement industry. 
Uh, but then scenario number one, we called it breakthrough technologies, uh, asked for a very high investment, but also just one actor. Scenario number uh, two is uh, efficient use and recycling, which asks low investments, but from multiple actors on the supply chain. And then uh, the third scenario is called structural optimization and circular economy, which asks high investments um, to different actors on the supply chain. So here are the different techniques that I discussed in the, diff in the previous slides, and they are uh, applied to the different scenarios uh, as shown here. So don't hesitate to look into the report to get more details of the different scenarios. But I just want to show you the results in CO2 emission reductions. Um, so this is the reference scenario, basically business as usual, asking just the cement industry mostly uh, to, to do efforts. Um, the breakthrough scenario is really um, investing a lot in, 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 in more high investment uh, technologies, but just really the cement producers mostly. And then scenario two is really all of the, all of the actors, but le lesser investment. And then the scenario three is also including the, the structural optimization and circular economy efforts. And this is obviously the most uh, efficient one, but also the one that requires the most collaboration between the actors of the supply chain. So to end, um, we, we recommended a few policy changes uh, that we could, uh, uh, because this was for the Europe Climate Foundation, so we wanted to show a little bit what we could do in terms of policies to reduce the carbon uh, impacts of con the concrete sector. So basically you can, obviously close the older, um, less efficient plants. Uh, regulating landfill would be also really uh, positive. Providing public-private financial support for carbon capture and storage. Um, incentivize local partnerships between cement and uh, waste producers, compensate for loss of productivity for the supplementary cementitious materials. Um, Invest in efficiency uh, clay calciners and require carries to provide more than one granular class. Include more time for design as a criterion for awarding contracts and enforce respect of standards. Um, and then uh, the last one is tax complete demolition and promote deconstruction, uh, which is really to go towards the, the more circular economy and uh, structural optimization uh, policy. So these uh, are a little bit the conclusions of the report. I will invite you to look a little bit at the work of Aurélie, uh, Favier, Guillaume Habert and Karen Scrivener uh, that did a lot of work for uh, this research on concrete uh, and how to de decarbonize the concrete industry. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Catherine. Um, and with that, we'll, we'll pass it on to Matthew. Um, thanks very much, Lindsay, and um, thanks very much, Catherine. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. So I'll, I'll jump right in there, and it's a pleasure to be here. So to um, go over some of the same ground from, from a steel perspective, why, why is steel carbon intensive? Um, to make this um, very, very simple, um, and, and of course it's far more complex than this, there are basically two ways of making steel. One is from iron ore, you dig it out of the ground, um, and that's iron oxide, um, that's the chemistry lesson. And the other way of making steel is to use scrap metal. Um, and in both cases, you need some energy to do that. Um, from the iron ore route, um, the traditional way of making steel is to use coal, carbon, um, for your energy. And that will also grab the oxygen off the iron, off the iron oxide, leaving you with Fe iron and CO2 GHG emissions out of the chimney. Um, for scrap metal, you're using a lot of electricity and you're melting it. So those are the two um, basic routes. Um, for scrap metal though, you have to ask where is that electricity coming from? And the answer is if it's coal generated or natural gas generated, um, then of course you're creating greenhouse gas emissions from your electricity, electricity generation. And of course, also you need the iron ore, you need the scrap metal in the first place, which has come from iron ore. So um, scrap metal is not, not, a, not an immediate route, if you like, to avoiding iron ore. So where does the carbon come from today? Um, about 72% of the world's steel production comes from iron ore, and the rest more or less from scrap. 
Um, it takes about 1.3 tons of iron ore and 0.8 tons of coal to make a ton of steel. If you compare the emissions, it's a lot less emissions intensive to make steel from scrap than it is from iron ore. Um, roughly speaking, and these are world averages and there's a lot of variation, 2.2 2 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent to make a ton of steel, and perhaps 0.7, I'm sorry, it should read 0.7 tons um, per ton from scrap, and the global average coming in at about 1.9 tons CO2 equivalent per ton of steel. Um, global production last year was about 1.9 um, thousand million, 1.9 billion tons of steel, so 3.6 gigatons of CO2. Um, that's a lot of CO2 from steel making. Um, the steel, steel is endlessly recyclable, so the longer term, the future for reducing GHG emissions from steel must be, if we're going to go on using steel, to reach the circular economy using more scrap and ensuring that the energy for, steel, for, for scrap, so the steel made from scrap, comes from renewable energy. So that's the long-term future. Um, there are some challenges with that. Um, one one um, challenge, if you like, for moving there fast is that 80 to 85 percent of steel scrap is already recycled. So whilst there's room for improvement, there's not a massive room for improvement to, to bite into that 72 percent of steel um, which is currently being made from iron ore because a lot of the scrap is already being recycled in current steel use. Um, as the amount of steel produced increases over time, um, there's more steel available for recycling, but there's a time lag. So if you put steel into a building, the half-life for recovering that steel is 30 plus years. It can be less for cars and such like. Um, and that's reflected in that diagram on the right showing um, the change in crude steel production from iron ore and from scrap in China, um, and then predicted into the future, that the amount of scrap will increase over time. The amount of steel from iron ore will decrease, but it takes some time to get there. Um, a few more numbers there. The, if you look at the steel stock in a developed economy, you're looking at 12 or 13 tonnes of steel per head in today's stock. Um, in China, which is, if you like, on that road to a developed economy with the infrastructure, the buildings, you're looking at five tonnes per head. And in India or Africa, where the future demand will come from, around one tonne a head. Now that can change, but it gives you an indication of the amount of steel that the world is likely to need over the next 30 or 40 years. And that's reflected in those numbers for the percentage of steel made from scrap today. So the most advanced in terms of time, developed economies, um, a very large proportion of their steel is coming from scrap. And the ones that economies that have developed, developed more recently, it's a lower percentage as you would expect. So what can the world do to reduce those huge greenhouse gas emissions coming from the steel sector? Well, one thing is to use less steel, use steel more efficiently. And there are a number of ways um, of doing that, um, reducing the um, sort of more efficient engineering, so using less steel to do, avoiding over-engineering of steel, um, using alloys, which increase the strength compared to the weight of steel, um, and, um, and clever design using less steel. We can recycle more. There's quite a good story to tell on recycling, 80-85%, so it's challenging to increase that massively, but we should certainly try and recycle as much as we possibly can. Uh, improve recyclability, and there are elements of design there to make recycling and, and indeed reuse uh, more possible. Um, and we should be looking for ways to use the best material for the job. Now we're looking at GHG emissions particularly, um, and steel can, be, can then be compared with concrete, with aluminium, with glass, um, with wood, with other materials. The best material may not be steel, but we should look at the comparison on a like-for-like -like basis um, and also, I think, consider other environmental and social issues to choose the best material for the job and also to think about life cycle issues in that, in that respect. But as well as all that, and I emphasise as well, we need to reduce the GHG emissions from steel making. From scrap, that means how do we achieve more scrap metal using energy from renewable energy sources and ultimately to reduce that net emissions to zero. And for primary steel, it means phasing out coal. And there are ways of doing that, for example, by using hydrogen instead of carbon as the reduction material. But then you have to make the hydrogen and that requires energy. 
So then again, you're looking at renewable energy to produce your hydrogen fundamentally. Um, and then we can look at carbon capture and storage. We can look at um, other sources of carbon from biofuels, for example, um, from um, eucalyptus charcoal, um, et cetera. So there are ways of doing this. It is very challenging. And for primary steel making in particular, that's expensive. We're, we're looking at to, to change the way primary steel is made over the next 30 or 40 years. You're looking at a few trillions of dollars of capital investment. And that's to make a product which is perhaps 20% more expensive than a comparable product today made from coal. So what's best practice for steel users and specifiers? And I want to start off by, um, I suppose, making life a little bit more complicated for everybody by saying, well, surely it's just specify low GH steel. Yes, that's got to be good, hasn't it? Um, the problem with that, um, if it's only that, is that at the moment it looks good from the project perspective. So my project maybe is using steel from a supplier using um, primary metal from iron ore with a high GHG footprint. And I specify for my project, well, I'll use a low GHG steel. And the shortcut for that is to use scrap based steel. So my GHG emissions for my project have gone down and I feel good about myself. The problem with that is that in a world in which the supply of steel from scrap is limited, um, that is likely to mean that somebody else that was using that scrap is now using steel made from iron ore. So the world hasn't reduced its GHG emissions, even if your project has a lower GHG footprint. So what's the way around that? Um, and it's a challenge which I think a lot of us have been scratching our heads around how to take a, how, how to use how to use the support from downstream users of steel who are committed to reducing their GHG emissions without that becoming a shortcut to using scrap, but then the scrap is replaced by iron ore used somewhere else. Um, for responsible steel, um, our proposition is that you should be looking at the proportion of iron ore and scrap metal and in the steel you use and specifying thresholds that take account of that proportion. So if the steel is made from 100% um, scrap metal, you should be looking at a threshold which is 0.5 tonnes or lower, for example. But if you're using steel from iron ore, your threshold might be two tonnes or lower. Whatever that proportion, you're driving GHG emissions down for that steel making route. There are other ways of doing it. Um, and I'm just using that as an example of how responsible steel is tackling this problem. More generically, um, what should you do? And I'm targeting this if you're in the using specifying um, part of the supply chain for steel. And I wanted to say three things, medium, long and short term. Long term, start with where we need to get to. We need to get to net zero by 2050, give or take. Ask that question and focus on that. Having asked that question, what's the roadmap to get there? What are the five year, 10 year milestones on that journey? And that may be quite a complex journey. And then finally, this is not an excuse for delay. What can be done now? What can be done today? Um, very sort of high level generically, I think all organizations could set their own net zero date. Ask what that means, ask what that date could be and set it and make that commitment. In terms of steel procurement, work out within that date, what does that mean for your steel procurement and think on a 10 year timeline. And then one's looking at signaling. Find like minds, group together with other organizations who are making the same commitments or similar commitments and signal your commitments as large as, as loud as you can. And they will be to some extent future looking. Simply saying we are committed to net zero by let's say 2050 creates market demand. It will allow steel makers to make the investments needed to meet that demand. But also think shorter term than that. 2030, 10 years time or five years time. And these are examples of the kinds of commitments that steel, make, steel users, depending on your, your use of steel, could make. In five years time, we will only source steel produced by steel makers with their own net zero target date. In 10 years time, we will only source steel that meets a responsible steel requirement or an equivalent and, or another standard. But those are the kind of commitments you can make to create demand. Um, Finally, on the right there, just to draw attention to, it's not just a responsible steel story. There are standards out there. There is complexity out there. 
standards and assurance are designed to make that complexity easy so that the complexity is built into the standard and then suppliers, downstream users can reference those standards. So looking for um, uh, green building standards like the um, US LEEDS approach, the Australian Green Star, BRIAM, um, there's a project Steel Zero that we're working with with the climate group to help work out how downstream users can make their specifications simple and then commit to them. And then there are organizations like the um, Science-Based Targets Initiative to work with companies to help them design effective um, science-based targets to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. So there are lots of resources out there um, to try and deal with that complexity. Um, and finally, on my final slide, I've just given you a couple of, um, I've given you my, my details if you'd like to follow up and also some links to the Science-Based Targets Initiative and a link to my colleague at the Climate Group who's leading that work on, on Steel Zero. Um, thanks very much. Great, thank you so much, Catherine and Matthew. Um, we have a couple of questions coming in, but I have one question, Matthew, for you um, while you're up. Do you have a, a base point for how many companies have uh, committed to responsible steel? Um, and how easy is it for designers to find that information? Um, thanks very much. Yes, our, our membership is on our website. There are at the moment um, five steel makers who, who are members of Responsible Steel. Um, ArcelorMittal, Bluescope, Otto Kumpu, um, Aparam and Bustalpina. Um, the, and we hope that will be growing. We, well, it is growing over time and we expect it will be growing. Um, we hope we'll be able to make new announcements later this year and, and going into next year. Um, those steel makers commit to having details are still under development, but we expect them to have at least one of their steel making sites certified within two or three years of the system becoming available. Um, ArcelorMittal have announced their, their um, um, timeline to get their Flat Steel Europe certified, and that's on our website, and have Flat Steel Europe ArcelorMittal certified by the end of next year. And Bluescope have announced that their site in Australia um, will be under evaluation or complete the evaluation by the end of next year also. So we expect that to be growing, but that's where we are at the minute. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so a question that came in, and Catherine, this might be for you. Um, in your report, did you look at alternative pozzolans? Uh, so this question is specifically on volcanic ash and concrete. Um, what research has been done, and can you quantify the embodied carbon reduction of that? Yeah, so I, we, we talked about it in the report, uh, but I also um, worked on this uh, when I was doing my PhD at MIT with Kunal. Um, uh, and so there is also a paper that you can find specifically on this topic, uh, where we looked at the uh, embodied carbon reduction thanks to volcanic ash. Um, and I think the paper is on my research gates page, so I would invite uh, the person interested in this question. Um, to, to, to read this paper, because I think that's a really good summary about the embodied carbon of volcanic ash replacement in concrete. Great, thank you. Um, and then I think for you, Matthew, um, is there a good reference for steel shapes that come from the two different furnace types? So the scrap steel from an electric arc furnace versus iron ore steel from a basic oxygen furnace. Do you know of a good reference on that? I'm sorry, for, for the steel what? For the steel shapes. Steel shapes. Um, I don't have a good reference to hand. I can look into that and I can let you know, Lindsay, and then see if I can share that with your, with your group. Sure, that'd be great. Um, I will say one of Architecture 2030's resources, the Carbon Smart Materials Palette, um, which you can find at materialspalette.org. Um, I do believe we have some information on that in there, mostly about shapes that come from electric arc furnaces, so the scrap steel. Um, though I'd also have to look into the basic oxygen furnace side as well. Um, thank you. Let's see if we have one more question. Uh, we did get a question about concrete efficiency. Um, and for both of you, you highlighted the fact that efficiency is one of the, the biggest opportunities for embodied carbon reduction. Um, do you want to expand on that a little bit more? Sure. Um, so basically, we, we work a lot on, uh, on structural optimization. Um, especially the Structural Exploration Lab. Uh, there is some work done on this. Um, and I mentioned also the work done by the Block Research Group at ETH. Um, so I would invite uh, the uh, participants to really look into that work that they do. They do really thin vaulted structures with uh, concrete. They do also really uh, th these very efficient slabs that I mentioned. 
so I think that's really on the structural optimization side. I think there is a lot of interesting work also done um, at the structural design lab at MIT as well. Um, so basically, uh, this is really the, the, the structural optimization part, but then there's also the reuse part or um, uh, where, where we really look into prefab concrete elements that we can reuse and, and so on, which would also be interesting to look at. And therefore, I would really recommend looking a bit at the circular economy work at TU Delft, but also at the VUB uh, done on those, uh, th those topics. Great, thanks. Yeah, that, that case study you showed of actually moving the, the precast, uh, I can't think of the right word, but the whole entire yeah. box. Yeah, yeah, that's a really interesting yeah. point. Yeah, yeah that's a yeah. quite impressive example, but obviously yeah. most concrete structures don't look like this, but this was really an example of uh, a building that was really designed uh, to be disassembled uh, in a sense, because uh, none of the connections were really um, cast in place, right? So all the, it was just, sitting there with gravity and so we could just really take it out without breaking anything. Interesting. Yeah. All right, so in terms of circular economy for concrete members, are you seeing more applicability for like whole members like that or more being used yes. as like an aggregate or? So basically there are two ways to do a circular economy with concrete is really to reuse the entire element and this works best with um, prefab elements that have been connected in, in a way that you can deconstruct it without breaking any of the connections. So for example, uh, um, dry connections basically. Uh, but obviously a lot of concrete structures are, are really, the, the connections are really cast with the reinforcement and so on. So everything is kind of glued together in a way um, with this concrete. And so this is, this is a bit more difficult than to reuse because you really have to break it uh, to take the elements uh, out of there. And so for these kind of concretes, uh, the, the best way to do it is really to recycle it and to just like use it as aggregate, for example. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and then Matthew, I'll go back to you with that original question on uh, structural efficiency. Um, did you want to add anything there? Um, I don't, I, I'm, I'm, so could you remind me what the question was? <laughs> I, was I was listening to Catherine, Catherine's reply and it was very interesting. I've forgotten what the question was. Right, not a problem. Um, so the question was around, uh, both of you highlighted um, efficiency and material optimization as a, a key opportunity for reducing embodied carbon. I'm just wondering if you have anything additional to add there regarding steel efficiency. Um, well, maybe a little bit, just to add a little bit to what I was mentioning about alloys. So niobium, for example, one can use um, um, high, so high specification alloys to increase the strength and then greatly reduce the amount of steel being using. Um, I'm not a, a structural engineer, but some of the examples that I've heard people, people speaking about are reducing the um, specifications of the steel as one moves up buildings. So the higher up the building one goes, the less the, the steel strength specification needs to be. Um, those kinds kinds of elements and also in fact looking at the um, and those, those sort of uh, concrete designs which Catherine was saying, you know, there's a similar approaches to, to steel um, being used. Um, but I'm, I'm afraid I'm not a um, an, an engineer, so I'm not sure how much I can how much I can really contribute to that. Right, great. No, that's helpful. Um, I will also say for the attendees, we do have a session later on that focuses on structural optimization. Um, it'll be the first session after the break, so um, I believe in about an hour and a half or so from now. Um, so if you're interested in that topic, you can you can learn more in that session. Um, and that's all I'm seeing for questions. Uh, so we could probably go ahead and pause this there. Um, for the attendees, uh, you can find your next session on the Carbon Positive website um, on the attendee, or sorry, on the agenda page, which you can see here. And with that, I just want to say thank you again to Matthew and Catherine for your expertise and your insight. And we hope to see you all on a later session. Thank you. Thanks, thank Matthew. you very much.